really know anything different, right? So I grew up with what I grew up with, and I didn't know anything else. Um, but you know, I went to boarding school when I was 10, um, and I spent my vacations with both my parents, either my mom or my dad. Um, and uh, and yeah, when she retired and she uh, finished her career, then I actually ended up seeing her a lot more later in life. So I think my mother grew up in England um, and was sent to boarding school when she was eight. And my father grew up in Australia and he also went to boarding school when he was eight, which was the common age of that generation to send their children away. So to their mind, I got an extra two years at home. Um, and so, and both of their families also, you know, all the kids went to boarding school when they were quite young. So uh, I guess it's just a difference of cultures, right? In America, you don't do that, but uh, in their cultures, you did. Gosh, that's an interesting question. The best thing I got from my mother, um, a sense of deep skepticism. <laughs> well, my mother was just always very, you know, she was kind of a tiger mom. She was Chinese Malay, and she was always questioning the world, you know what I mean? Like, well, what do you want out of it, you know, kind of thing. And so I think that I, my, in my journalism, um, my, my skepticism comes from her. Um, no, actually, she really didn't. She, she, I was, I studied art history in undergraduate, and um, and she really wanted me to go work for an art gallery or a museum, and you know, get married and have kids. She was sort of um, didn't really like the idea of me being a journalist until I started covering the White House, and then she thought, oh well, maybe, maybe this is okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, I wanted to get a real sense from women who had achieved, who had managed to sort of um, break the glass ceiling, so to speak, um, a real sense of how they did it um, and the challenges that they faced. And what was, you know, and the point of the book is, is the idea of critical mass. And so somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, whether it's a legislature or a corporate board, a Navy ship or an appellate court, how women... Um, when they reach that sort of feminine tipping point, they begin to really change things, and they change the way things are done. And so, for me, um, I was interested in, in their experience, in their experiences of when they reached that critical mass, and how things changed for them, um, and how they began to govern and differently, and to command differently, and adjudicate differently. Um, I know that in my life, I've felt like I've reached critical mass, you know, at certain points in my life, and you really do feel like it's sort of a click, and you're like, oh wait, there's like more than just me as a woman in the room. There's like a bunch of women in the room and you just, you kind of have this realization. And so I was interested in that, in that sort of phenomenon and, and documenting it in other women's experiences. So the idea of the book isn't, is, is about how women need to permeate the workforce, you know, in all levels of the workforce. And so currently women make up 47% um, of the workforce, but there are three fourths of shift workers and two thirds of minimum wage workers. Um, but the idea is that women won't actually fully be able to change the way we manage and command and um, govern until they reach the upper, middle and upper echelons of the workforce. And so in order to reach those middle and upper echelons, you have to talk to people who've actually reached those points already to get a sense of what they went through to get there. Absolutely. I mean, in my experience, you know, coming up through the White House press corps and the congressional press corps and even on campaigns, um, you know, it was a real sort of noticeable tipping point for me, you know, when I went from being the only woman in my office at time to having five women in my office at time. And now we, and we all, you know, had dinner and drinks and went out with each other and commiserated with each other and understood each other. Same thing with the White House Press Corps when I first started there, um, gosh, 13, 14 years ago. Um, there weren't that many women in the Press Corps. Now, you know, Obama just last year had a press conference we called on all women. That wouldn't have happened when I first started. And the women that I sort of came up with in that Press Corps very much supported each other. We all sort of, you know, under, we had, a lot of us reached across organizations to plan dinners with sources so that, um, you know, so that we could all do it together. Uh, we um, had dinners with each other and drinks with each other, sort of commiserating on what it was like being a woman on the beat. Um, so again, I think it's generationally, right? So um, I think some of the older generation didn't perhaps experience this, but certainly in Washington, I feel I was amazed at. I mean, there's like women's parties for everything. There's like women's groups for like everything. It's, I mean, there's like women opposition researcher groups. Like there's like women like you know, um, like legislative aides, you know, groups on the hill. I mean, like you think of like whatever position it is, and there's a women's group that gets together and does it. Like in Washington D.C., it's kind of amazing. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I think certainly in Washington, there's women's groups everywhere, and it's a phenomenon that's 
pretty widespread. Um, I do believe that in the corporate workforce, they they're very more, they're behind the public sector, and that is, you know, one of the chapters I write about is how the public sector has leapt ahead of the private sector in the last decade, um, and why the private sector, you know, the lessons the private sector could learn from Washington. And I think one of those lessons is a very natural sense of how women get together and organize themselves and support each other in ways that the private sector is still trying to figure out. Um, well, I, so I think there's two versions to that. Um, one is I have a chapter that looks at, um, you know, on the public sector side, uh, the fact that the Republican women are having a really hard time getting elected is one of the biggest hindrances to progress right now because the public sector is leading progress. In order for more progress to be made, you need to have a partner across the aisle. It can't just be Democratic women doing this. It has to be Democratic and Republican women doing it. And in order to have partners across the aisle, you have to elect more Republican women. And that's something that um, you, they, the Republican Party used to be the party of women. They were Susan B. Anthony, they were the ones who first brought women into, into the electorate. Um, and I think they're just beginning now to recognize that they have a problem speaking to women and that and they're beginning to address that and solve it. So I think that's one problem. Uh, on the private sector, um, just getting, you know, I think you, you need to really bring, um, to, in order to bring women fully into the workforce, I think you also have to bring men fully into the lives at home, right? So uh, when men begin to uh, take care of the kids, when men begin to do the bulk of the housework, which women still do the bulk of both, then women will have more free time to get more into the workforce. And so when both sides are equal, I think you'll see, you know, and, and there's more support for, you know, child care, for, you know, universal pre-K, for, I mean, all the things that we think of, equal pay, um, then, then yes, I think those are the challenges in the private sector. So the last chapter I look at, it looks at the millennial generation and how they're kind of the hope for the future in some degrees because they're the first generation that was born just automatically assuming equality between the sexes, right? And they, and they they demand equal time off, you know what I mean? Like men or women, they want time with their children. 30% of um, the first contact, first contact for kindergartners in America today are men. Um, this is a generation that believes that men should step up and they want to be as involved with their children's lives as their wives are. And so I have a lot of hope that the future will change because this generation is already changing it. I interviewed Carly Fiorina for the book and um, she talks about, I mean obviously she, I think in the beginning of her campaign she was um, less inclined to make an appeal to directly to women. I think in the last sort of debate, you saw her speak to camera in her introduction and make a very direct appeal to women. Um, and so she, I think, Fiorina, out of all the candidates and the writer, is probably the most aware uh, of appealing to women voters of, of, and what appeals to them. Um, and certainly, you know, she talked about women's issues, um, well, quote unquote, women's issues, which really, when you talk to Republicans, all economic issues are women's issues. Um, in the last debate, it'll be interesting to see how well that plays with the electorate moving forward and whether it gains her any ground. Um, you know, Donald Trump has yeah, got a lot of issues with women, I think, um, and I write about this in the book too. Um, he has, you know, a lot of polls show him underwater, especially with millennial women, um, and that's a problem if he becomes the nominee for the Republican Party, considering millennial women are a very key demographic go to voting bloc, and women vote 10% more than men on average, and if you if you actively put them off, you can't win an election. Um, he, he will drive out turnout for Hillary, if that's the case, and so, um, or for Bernie, depending on who the Democratic nominee is. But um, but it looks it's looking likely that it'll be Hillary. But both Hillary and Bernie Sanders have very good records with women. You know what I mean? Like they. Um, Hillary especially obviously has spent the bulk of her career talking about women. She was like her she was the one who first wore you know pants to the Oval Office and like into in the West Wing and then enabled women across America to wear pants to work, which I think is insane. Um, and so you know, I interviewed Hillary for the book as well as Carly Fiorina. Um, it's hard to rate them, you know, I mean like it's especially because these this early in the campaign, they're very vague about their policies. So, well, it's for any working women. It's it's for any woman who's had this phenomenon. You know what I mean? Like who's experienced critical mass. Any woman who, I mean, I personally like I I was really surprised when I learned about the phenomenon of 
critical mass because I thought my whole life, wow, it'll take you know for us to reach parity for to really make a difference. And I was kind of delightful, delightfully surprised to realize we don't actually have to get to parity to make a difference. We only have to get to critical mass, and we're right at the cusp of it in so many places in the workforce. So we can't. I mean, not I'm not. That's not to diminish the importance of getting to parity. We absolutely need to still get to parity. But the fact of the matter is, we're already having a huge impact, and we, you know, and once we get to critical mass in all sectors of the workforce, we will have enormous impact on the workforce. And that was really heartening for me to realize, as a woman, you know, in my generation. Um, as a woman, you know, and at the end, it's sort of the tail end of millennials or the beginning of millennials. Um, but also for, you know, all women in the workforce. The idea that, you know, that we're so close to having these huge impacts, the way the women of the Senate did when they first got together, they ended up producing 75% of the legislation in the 113th Congress. I mean, that's a huge amount of impact, right? Like, and so if you just get to that point, that critical mass, you, it is so discernible, that tipping point, and you really can powerfully change things.